So, today I am pleased to launch my new series titled My Favorite Games. This is a series I've been wanting to do for a while now because one of my regular viewers messaged me a few months ago and said, you know, for all of the uh, commentary you've done on video games as of late, uh, defending them and uh, speaking out in favor of them and all of that, we still don't know what your favorite video games actually are. I thought about doing just a one-off video to address this, but then it occurred to me that this could actually be a really cool series, because it would give me an opportunity to talk about the artistry, creativity, and cultural impact that a lot of these games have had, as well as their personal meaning for me. Playing some of these games has the same deeply nostalgic uh, essence of childhood feel as, say, watching the Charlie Brown Christmas special. So. To talk about these games and champion them in that regard was one thing I wanted to accomplish. And the other thing was to contribute to uh, what would hopefully be a raising of the bar in terms of game journalism. On the one hand, we have a lot of people out there playing the shitty games that suck ass and uh, commenting on them. And uh, I enjoy those videos, don't get me wrong. But then on the other hand, we have the social justice warriors who have come to dominate the discourse in gaming journalism as of late. The, uh, the social justice warriors, as I see them, have adopted what I call hipster puritanism. They uh, pretend to abhor or appear to abhor violence in video games as being something that is uh, lowbrow and uncool. They are above that sort of thing. They're just above sexuality in games. They're above all of the things that we've enjoyed about games for so long now and what they t seem to enjoy more than actually playing games is telling us all why we should feel ashamed for enjoying every single game we enjoy except for the ones that they enjoy playing those are fine anyway those both of those uh, extremes of discourse in the gaming uh, journalism as of late seem to be dominating the scene. So I want to do something that really speaks to video games as art and as a uh, innovative medium. So in doing that, uh, we will begin the series tonight, today, what have you, with Dune. Take it away. A direct tie-in to the film and novel of the same name, this game turned me on to the work of Frank Herbert and David Lynch, two of my key storytelling influences, in one fell swoop. I think I was about eight years old when I got this game as a gift from my dad who wanted to turn me on to one of the greatest stories in the history of science fiction. I was immediately absorbed into the game's world, one that combined the aesthetics of science fiction with an exotic Middle Eastern flair. I remember playing the game, and when I first saw Gurney Halleck, I noticed the scar on his cheek and the slightly devious glint in his eyes, and I felt like I was allying myself with someone of potentially devious morality. Later, I would encounter Fremen, the natives of Dune, who would be initially wary of me until I earned their loyalty and trust. This was unlike anything I had played before. Previously, video games hadn't introduced moral uncertainty between the characters. Though the graphics would be considered crude and primitive by today's standards, I used to get lost in them. The relative simplicity of the terrain contributed to the vast bleakness of the planet.
We've spotted three troops of Fremen around the palace, and I've sent Gurney Halleck to meet them. He's not returned yet. Go there and see what's keeping Gurney. Paul, I have a deep feeling that being here on Dune with these Fremen will reveal something to you. Something you can't even imagine. were a time of technological breakthroughs in the realm of computers, and while they would certainly seem insignificant when compared to modern times, the excitement in the air back then was akin to the Chicago World's Fair in 1933. As the human race marveled with unabashed innocence at the possibilities of the modem, the CD-ROM drive, 16-bit graphics, 256 colors, and a whole host of other developments, the cyberpunk stylings of William Gibson and Bruce Sterling were the science fiction du jour, and there was an air of excitement about embracing computer technology as though we as a species were finally bridging the gap between the technology of our reality and the technology of our imaginations. For me, Dune is one of the standout games of this era. I can remember as a kid, one of my chores was to mow the lawn, which I would normally do on a Saturday. This was a task that took about an hour at best, but as a kid it seemed like an eternity. Nevertheless, I secretly enjoyed the drudgery. It gave me time to get lost in my thoughts and mentally lay out the kinds of stories I wanted to tell in my writing. I loved the mechanics of it all. Hearing the motor kick over, feeling the handlebar shake in my hand, and that wonderfully evocative smell of gasoline. When I finished mowing, I would return to the cool air conditioning of the house for a Gatorade or a Sprite and unwind with some games. Dune was frequently one of these, perhaps due in part to the fact that it echoed the aura that hovered about me, the rugged manual labor of the native people blended with the refined intellectualism of the ruling class. Dune seamlessly merged the two into something akin to a religious experience. Searching new messages. Message from the Emperor Shaddam IV. I want a shipment of spice today. The Emperor only seems to be interested in getting spice. Hmm. I wonder if he is hiding something. Yeah, <laughs> we won the battle, Muad'Dib. These graphics, as I say again and again, may seem primitive to younger gamers, but when I took Stilgar and Chani for a ride in an ornithopter or on the back of a worm, I was there. I can remember sitting in the bathtub the night I got that game and just staring at the box art. There was something marvelously hypnotic about the game as there was about the story itself. Dune is an effortlessly complex and multi-layered narrative. Paul Atreides, the story's main protagonist and the game's playable character, is one of the most compelling characters in science fiction. He is believed to be the one who is foretold in Fremen prophecy, and he liberates them from bondage to the Harkonnen and to the Emperor Shaddam IV, yet his reign as emperor in the subsequent novels is brutal, fascistic, and heavily fueled by religious zealotry. Everything about him should cast him as a villain, yet we still observe him as the hero. Dune is a beautiful game to play, and it's equal parts adventure game, resource management, and military strategy sim. The music is evocative and exotic, giving the game the quality of a lucid dream. The only criticism I can offer is that, one, the military strategy aspect is very simplistic, and if you're any good at military strategy games at all, you'll eventually develop an army so strong that when you order them to attack a Harkonnen fortress, they'll usually have it defeated before you arrive on the scene to command them, and two, the ending is summed up in such a cheesy manner that if the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen said the words, if it wasn't for you meddlesome kids, it would be an episode of Scooby-Doo. 
you'll know what I'm talking about when you get there. Central to my appreciation for the game, indeed for most games, is the music. There's an emerging trend in popular music of the late 80s and early 90s, which was to take the indigenous folk stylings of various cultures and render them in synthesizer form. Previously, acoustically captured examples of these traditional genres had been referred to as world music. But moving them into the realm of electronic instruments gave, gave rise to New Age music. Artists like Inya, Enigma, Vangelis, and Cusco came to define this wonderfully hybrid genre. On a side note, one of my personal favorites from this genre is the album First Flight by Palomino Duck, criminally underappreciated in the extreme. Dune made outstanding use of the emerging New Age style, and it fits the game perfectly. In a story of religious fanaticism that hangs equally between extremes of technological advancement and feral tribalism, the soundtrack could not have been more appropriate. It captures the seductive immersion of this incredibly appealing world that seemed all the more real and immediate when framed by the bright skies and limitless horizons of early 90s technological optimism. The few faults in this game are rendered meaningless in the face of what the game accomplishes. It takes you there and it takes you beyond, not just into the mindset of being on Arrakis, but into the psychic religiosity of the world, a world where the universe runs on fuel that is also a powerful narcotic that opens the untapped regions of the mind. There is a sequel, Dune 2, Battle for Arrakis, alternately called Building a Dynasty. Despite being more popular than its predecessor, I found myself uninterested. Dune 2 isn't a continuation of the previous story or game as such. It just uses Dune as the backdrop for a StarCraft-style strategy sim. It's certainly good for what it is, but StarCraft does it better, so why not just play that? To be fair, Dune 2 did give us many of the now standard elements in the modern strategy game, but that legacy still fails to give it a pass on its disregard for the source material. Dune seemed like the perfect way to begin this series. As Princess Cerulean so accurately puts it, a beginning is a very difficult time. And what better way to begin this new series than with a game that succeeds on such a transcendental level? 